Jason and I have talked about how to apply these policy templates to ensure that you meet your technical and business objectives, specifically talking about how often the data will be protected, where are you going to store it, which of the pools are you going to use to place the information, the quick access to the data via the snapshots or storage optimization via the dedupe, and lastly, how long that data will be retained. Now, one of the things I want to point out is the process of taking a snapshot is where we're impacting your network, where we're actually touching your infrastructure. We're taking your production data, and our initial ingest will be the entire uh, item that we're snapping. So if I have a 300 gigabyte VM, then I'm going to bring in that 300 gigabytes. From then on, we do incremental forever. I'm only capturing the change blocks but I am synthesizing a point in time copy within the snapshot pool. Again, because data that I need has a tendency to be discovered quickly, that being somebody uh, you know, realizes that they deleted something and so they call up the, the, you know, the help desk and say, can you bring that back? I'm retaining information in the snapshot pool because it's in the form that I need it. It's ready to be mounted, it's very quick, within a matter of seconds or minutes, I can have that information mounted into my device and I can go in there and actually drag and drop or do what it takes to recover the information. The dedo pool is really the recovery objective that I'm looking for. Setting a time limit of we can recover information up to 14 days as the defaults are in our best practices. So that means that for the first two days, the information is in the snapshot pool. But because it's in its major form, it takes up a lot of space in that pool. That's why I don't want to keep all of my images there. So I dedupe it. By deduping it, what we're going to do is we're going to look for any blocks that are duplicated in anywhere else within the system. The example that I use all the time is pretty simple, and that's if I was to create a Word document and you were to create an Excel uh, spreadsheet. Tonight's backup image is going to contain those because they're brand new. So that's going to be in the change blocks. And that information is going to be taken from the snapshot pool down to the dedupe engine. So we'll say it hits my, uh, my Word doc first. So we're in the process now of going through my document block by block. And it just turns out that none of the blocks are duplicated anywhere else. No problem, we're gonna store that information. Not only do we look for dedupe, but we actually compress things as well. Now it gets to the point, now it goes to do the next part of the image, and that part of the image is your Excel spreadsheet. Two different applications could be on two different systems brought into the Actifio appliance via the snapshot policy. So it gets to your Excel spreadsheets and it starts looking at it block by block. And all of a sudden it hits a block and it just happens, even though it's an Excel spreadsheet, that all the ones and zeros in that block line up to match one of my blocks in my Word doc. The ones and zeros are exactly the same. Rather than storing that block twice, once in my Word doc, once in your Excel spreadsheet, instead what it's going to do is it's going to maintain a simple pointer within your spreadsheet saying, that block is located here within this other document, within this image. Now that is a pretty simple example of what we can do, but if you look at something like a mail package, where if I took a photograph, for example, and sent it out to everybody who's participating in this webinar right now, then that means when you know, we're all on the same web uh, mail server, and you know tonight's backup, it's going to look and say, oh, well, here's this image, and it's in you know, Paul's uh, set directory. Oh, and here's this image, and it's in so-and-so's inbox, and somebody else has actually filed it. Another person saw it and trashed it. It's in their trash. So what we end up having is, uh, sorry, just looking, 10 of us. So what's going to happen is within the snapshot pool, we actually will have 10 copies of that image. But when we go down to dedupe it, we're going to look at it and say, wait a minute, these blocks all match. So therefore, we'll store one copy of it. Now, if that happened to be a one meg file, 
Look at the impact that we have. In the snapshot pool, there's going to be 10 megs of space utilized to store that. If I was to retain that for a long period of time, then you know, add that 10 meg to tomorrow, you know, somebody actually took it out of their trash, but eight of us didn't, you know, whatever. You could end up with using a phenomenal amount of space. By deduping it, we're only going to store one meg of that. The rest are little tiny pointers that maintain where that image is stored. That's the efficiency of dedupe. Now we take that image, as I said, snapshot down to dedupe. Now we're going to replicate it to our remote site. So once we've taken that image, we've deduped out, we've compressed it. Now when we go to replicate it, we know the information we've already sent across to that site. So we're only going to send anything that is different, just the deltas. So again, we reduce the amount of information that has to move and be stored at the other location. When you need to go and recover a file, you're always going to look first in the snapshot pool, see if it's there. If the image is not there, the next step would be to go to the dedupe pool. Now, when you go to a replicated site, you have the option of keeping the retention period the same or making it longer. A very traditional one would be to snap for two days, Right? dedupe it for 14, and perhaps keep it at the, re the remote site for 30 days. You have the option of setting these to determine how long you want to store it at each of these storage locations. What are your specific recovery point and recovery time objectives? And that's what you want to build your SLAs to do. Now, the SLAs are living, breathing documents in a way. You do have to monitor what's going on with the system. The failed job reports, the SLA violations being two of the great reports to tell you as to what's happening with processing the information. Because what you want to be aware of is that the, the SLA window, the hours of operation need to process all of the jobs. If you add more and more jobs to that, you run the risk that you cannot complete all of them in time. Now, any job that is running will run to completion. So if I have it set for 1900 to 7, as an example, again, at 1900, we're going to start processing our randomized list of the jobs that are being protected by this template. We're able to run, by default, six concurrent jobs. So I pick off the first six, I start processing. As soon as one is completed, I grab the next one off the list and I keep cycling through until I have protected all of them. Again, if I keep adding more and more devices or more and more applications to the system, I run the risk that I'll hit the end of the window and not have any some of the jobs processed. Now, any job that is in, in play will can run to completion but no new jobs will start. Thank you for joining us for another YouTube Tech Tip video. If you like the content you're seeing on this channel, please remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications so you will be alerted to any future content.